All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, okay, so a couple quick announcements. And, and I'm going to be honest, the announcements are probably going to be, um, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say stale, but, but we're sort of on autopilot mode at this point for the class. Um, for example, um, you know, we've already got our second exam done. We've got the second exam graded. So we're sort of like, you know, it's going to be a normal mode of operation, you know, lecture, homework, lecture, homework, until, until the end. I'll go ahead and tell you there are a couple of lectures in Beamland where we don't immediately assign a homework because there's some topics that I want to sink in. But it's going to kind of be the, the normal mode of operation for the, uh, for the rest of the semester. Um, I do want to mention one thing. We Actually, on Friday, we have a prospective student, and I, the student, and I believe the student's parents, going to come in and sit in on steel design. I said, come on in. You know, We'll be talking about column design. It'll be a great day. Um, so if you're wondering you know, uh, who our guests are, that's, that's who they are. OK, um, so in terms of uh, where we're at with columns, so what we did last time with the homework assignment was essentially this part. I'm curious how you felt the homework went. Was it pretty straightforward? Hopefully, it, it wasn't too complicated. I'm curious how many used an if statement and how many just said dispense with it and said, I'll just manually do it. How many used the if statement? Awesome. How many dispense with it? OK. All right. It doesn't really matter um, as long as you, know, you sort of got the right answer. I think one of the benefits of the if statement is that if you change the yield stress, it updates the curve correctly. Whereas if you sort of hard code it, you have to refigure out where you start using the first expression versus the second. Okay, um, But yeah, uh, the purpose of that homework assignment was really to get you familiar with this. And um, from a conceptual standpoint, here's the idea. If I give you a KL over R, can you compute FCR? Does everybody feel comfortable with that? That, that was really sort of the purpose of that homework assignment. Okay, now the only item I guess left, oh, and let me let me back up a little bit. So if you know FCR, the capacity is just phi of 0.9 times FCR times the gross area. So that's pretty easy. The only thing left to discuss is what the heck is the KL over R value? Because up until now, what we've been saying is if I treat KL over R as an input and I give you that value, what is the output? And that's easy. Okay, but for um, uh, for next, what we have to do is figure out how to determine KL over R. Now, I do want to make sure that we're comfortable with the, um, the K values for analysis and design. Remember, we are going to be using the recommended values, not the theoretical values. Again, the boundary conditions that we utilize for columns are mathematical abstractions. I mean, we can fabricate our connections and our end conditions to simulate them, but the real world is, you know, there's no such thing as perfect rigidity or perfect flexibility. There's going to be a little bit of restraint there. So we have to account for that. And so we, what we do is we bump our K values up just a little bit to, uh, uh, to have a little bit of cushion there. Again, in my little box here, note that theoretical values are just that, theoretical. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to determine KL over R. And what that means is talking about what's uh, termed the strong axis versus the weak axis for a given column. And so what I mean by that is I'm talking about axis identification, and I'm talking about the controlling KL over R. Because this is not a difficult concept to understand mathematically, but I also want you to understand it from a real world standpoint. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go back to just fundamental basics. Okay. So I have here table 1-1, one one, OK? And if you look at table 1-1, one one, you have uh, for a given W shape. And by the way, uh, I have this on um, the, the, a later slide, but I'll go ahead and say it now. From here on out for the rest of the semester, we're pretty much only going to be dealing with W sections, with, with I-shaped cross sections. And there's going to be some reasons for that. And it's going to become pretty clear and pretty evident as we get into Beamland and, and we get into some later stuff. Uh, but for now, unless otherwise noted, you can pretty much assume that we're going to be dealing with, uh, with W sections. OK. Uh, and, and if you want to get into real world, look at buildings. Look at the beams and columns. 
they're these. So that's kind of why. Um, okay. Now, if we look at a W shape and we open up table 1-1, we find that there are two radii of gyration. Does anybody remember from the last lecture how we compute a radius of gyration? It's the square root of what? No. Well, L, L over R is the slenderness, but how do we compute R? Boom. That's right. We take the moment of inertia, we divide it by the area, and we take the square root. Really, all a radius of gyration is, is a normalization of the moment of inertia, right? And what does the moment of inertia tell us? Well, here's an I-beam. It tells us how stiff an element is against bending. There's a reason why, if I have this section, why it's harder to bend it this way than it is this way. It's easier to flex this element about this axis because about this axis, the moment of inertia is smaller. And if the moment of inertia is smaller about one axis than it is another, then the radius of gyration is smaller about that, that similar axis. Again, radii of gyration are very convenient for use mathematically because if I take the length and divide it by the radius of gyration, I get a slenderness that is unitless. And a lot of times, unitless quantities are really easy to deal with uh, in formulas and equations. Okay, so for W shapes, there are two radii of gyration. There's an Rx and an Ry. And I'd like you to open up your steel manual to kind of see this. I want you to open to table 1-1 and just start looking at the properties for a W shape. And what you find is, for every single W shape that you can find, Rx is bigger than Ry. Okay? There is a reason that I-beams are configured the way they are. They are configured in such a way to try and maximize stiffness across one direction uh, as opposed to the other. That's why Rx is, is, uh, is always bigger than Ry. So much so that we tend to call Rx, or that axis reference, we call it the strong axis, versus Ry calling it the weak axis. Okay? Now, I want to be crystal clear that this isn't always the case for some other shape. So, for de and what I mean by that is for W sections, the X axis is always, RX is always bigger than RY. But RX is not always bigger than RY for other cross sections. For example, with uh, WTs, you might find the, the reverse. You might find that maybe for WTs, RY is bigger than RX. Um, and if a shape does not exhibit symmetry, like an angle, um, you have Rx and Ry, but there's also a listing for Rz, which is the minimum radius of gyration about its principal axis. So it's kind of like a more circle computation for a cross section. Is everybody with me so far? Now, let's see how this plays out in, in, a, in a given problem. So let's consider a column. We'll call it a W shape, and it is pinned on both ends. Okay. So we're going to say that the column is 20 feet long. So we'll say the length is 20 feet. Uh, we're going to say for simplicity, and I made these numbers up, but for simplicity, let's take Rx to be 6.2 inches and Ry to be 4.1 inches. Now, I, I said that it's a column that's pinned on both ends. So for pin pin boundary conditions, after our discussion last time, we know that K is 1. So how's the column going to buckle? Okay. Well, the way that we're going to do that is we're going to look at it from a slenderness perspective. Okay. So let's just chug this out. So hopefully as everybody has their Casio FX 115ES plus or similar scientific calculator. So we've got a KX and a KY, which is 1. All right. Um, we know the length on both axes is 20 feet. And we know the RX and the RY. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute a KL over R for the x-axis and a KL over R for the y-axis. So let's look at KL over R for the x-axis. So KL over R, so what do we have? We have 1, L is 20 feet, divided by RX. RX down here below is 6.20 inches. Um, anybody see a problem? Units, right? Don't forget to uh, convert your feet to inches. So we're going to say 12 inches per foot. Okay, and what is that? What is KL over R in the X direction for this column? Anybody have an answer? 
38.7. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay, so this is the slenderness about the x-axis. Let's put this down here. So we'll say KL over R about the x-axis is 38.7. So likewise, what about KL over R for the y-axis? So how's the calculation going to change? The only thing that's going to change is instead of 6.2, I'm going to have 4.1, right? Because it's the same length, same boundary conditions, etc. So I'm going to have KL over R in the y direction is just going to be this calculation repeated, only instead of 6.2, I'm going to have 4.1. What is that? Fifty-eight point five. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, I slipped a little bit of um, subtle language in there. I said, well, the bracing conditions the same on both directions, and I'm sure that probably leads to a question. Well, when could it be different? Well, we'll, we'll see that here in a second. But I want to take a look at these two values. So I have a column, and I've got two different slenderness values. It's saying that the slenderness about the x-axis is about 38.7, and the slenderness about the y-axis is 58.5. What does that mean? Okay, Here's the column right here. I take that column. I load it in compression. And when I load it at compression, what, I, what happens is I load it, and it buckles, right? Now, what? here's the thing. What happens if I take the column and I turn it 90 degrees and I do the same thing? The column buckles, but it doesn't buckle this way, right? The column buckles whichever way it's going to buckle, and it buckles about the direction that has the largest slenderness, right? Now, you all did your homework 5.1, and what happened as slenderness increased? What did the curve look like? Here's the, here's the curve, right? I'll draw a quick little picture of it, right? Here's the curve and the, oh, uh, go away. The curve looked something like that, right? And on the x-axis was KL over R, right? So this is KL over R. This is, you know, uh, F critical. What happens as the slenderness increases? As the KL over R gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens to the capacity? It goes down, right? See what I mean? I mean, the curve is essentially going down like that. So what that means is as columns get more and more slender, they get weaker, right? So what we are interested in as analysts is what is the, the segment and what is the direction about which slenderness is largest, right? Doesn't matter if I take the column this way and call it this way or this way. It's going to buckle whichever way it's going to buckle. In other words, here's the column and it buckles like this. I propose under these boundary conditions it is never going to buckle like that. It's never going to bow out like this way. You see what I mean? Because it's just more slender in one direction than it is the other. Does that make sense? Now, that begs the question. Dr. Mike, if the weak axis always... Now, now let's, let's look at the numbers. We had x-axis bracing here and x-axis bracing here, and here were the R values. Well, Dr. Mike, now hold on for a sec. You said that for W sections... Ry is always smaller. Well, if Ry is always smaller, do we ever have to check the strong axis? I mean, look at what we had here. Weak axis got 58.5. Strong axis got 38.7. Do we ever have to check the strong axis if this is always going to be the case for W sections? It's a pretty good question. The answer is yes, you do need to check the strong axis because you could have something like this. Okay? This is real world, right? We have a column that has different bracing conditions along one direction than it does the other, right? So imagine this column that has intermediate braces right here, but not along this, this axis. Suddenly, it buckling this way becomes impossible because there are beams framing into it along its length. Keep in mind, it's not 
which segment has the largest or smallest R value. It's which segment has the largest or smallest KL over R value. What we're interested in is the largest KL over R throughout the length of the column, right? So the way I want to explain that is I want to go back to this example, but imagine on the y-axis I place a brace. Let's say I place a brace right here, okay, in the middle of the column, right? Now, the x-axis is going to give the same answer, right? The x-axis is going to give KL over R for the x-axis of, what was it? Was it 38.7? 38.7. But now for the y-axis, things are different. Because for the y-axis, I've got pinned, pinned, so K is 1. The R is still 4.1, but now the length is different. By placing a brace in the middle of the column, I do not have a, a segment length of 20 feet. I have a segment length of 10 feet, right? Because the buckle is going to occur like that, right? So now I've got KY is 1, RY is 4.10 inches, and LY is not 20 feet, but 10 feet. Now, what is KL over R for the y-axis going to be? I ask you. Breaking out your Casio FX115 ES Plus or similar scientific calculator. What do we got? 29.3. 29.3, huh. Twenty-nine point three. Now, which axis governs the behavior? It's the strong axis because the strong axis has a larger slenderness. Now, did this brace help? Did it do any good? Well, yeah, it did good, right? Before our governing slenderness was in the fifties. Now our governing slenderness is in the thirties. So that brace obviously served to strengthen the capacity of the or increase the capacity of the column, right? But it also forced the governing axis to be the strong axis, not the weak. So if I load this column, it is going to buckle this way, not this way. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right. Any questions on that? I want to make sure that's really, that's really important. Okay. Now, let's talk about analyzing columns. Now, there are two means of analyzing columns. Before we get into this, I want to take a step back. We have slowly started to introduce the usage of design aids in this class, like table 7-1. Remember table 7-1? That was the table the, that listed the volt shear capacity. So we said, look, here's the deal. You've got a... Um, uh, 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 a325, three-quarter inch diameter bolt under single shear, boom, here's the capacity, right? The table did a lot of the math for us. That's going to start to happen a lot more in column and beam land. In fact, there's going to be some design components where it's impossible to do without the, the manual, without the guides. That should be pretty evident looking at the equations that we dealt with in our last homework assignment. Just trying to design a column using those equations is kind of kind of nuts, right? So, so just keep that in mind. Now, I propose that we're going to use, which I propose that there's two really effective methods for analyzing a column. And by analyzing a column, we're talking about determining its capacity. You know how it works in this class. We uh, take us an element, learn how to determine its capacity, and then the next step is how do we select an element to appropriately resist a given load. And so that's design. Now, we're going to use two different methods for analysis, okay? We're going to use method one, which is, the method one is, I, I, there's no magic behind these names. I just sort of call them method one and method two. But method one is just to use the equations that you all just got familiar with in your last homework assignment to compute capacity. The second is to use a uh, analysis aid, table 4-1A. That's a tab-worthy uh, table if I've ever seen one. 
Um, it is critical to the appropriate selection of columns. It is so critical that there is actually a snippet of table 4-1A in your FE reference manual that's available to you on the FE exam. It's actually in the FE reference manual, this table. Um, it's that important. Okay. Now, both methods will actually yield the same answer. So the, the two methods are going to serve as a check for one another, right? So you do the, the analysis one way, you do it the second way, you're going to get the same answer. Um, the, the, the reason that I'm showing you both is really from a design standpoint, what you're going to do is use table 4-1A for design, and you're going to get a column, and then you're going to check that column using method 1 to make sure that your capacity works. And all I'll say is that's really important in design land, okay? Um, I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole, but what I will say, and this will become clear on Friday, is that Friday and Monday, is that as you go through the land of design, we're going to go through a lot of different iterations of potential columns. And so having a means to independently check the capacity is very important. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, there is um, another A, table 4-22. It can prove useful, but we're not going to use it for now, just for simplicity. Um, so I'll just sort of leave it at that. Think of method 1 as your push mower. Think of method 422 as your self-propelled mower, and this is your riding mower. So we're going to use the push mower and the riding mower. We're going to dispense with the self-propelled. Is that better? Good analogy. Anybody enjoy? I like mowing the lawn. I don't know about anybody else. So. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit about both methods, but we're going to start off by focusing on method one. My goal today is to compute the capacity and make sure that you understand how to compute the capacity using method one. So method one is column analysis using section E3. All it is is do what we did today, determine the largest KL over R, Step two and three should be pretty familiar. We determine FE, then we determine F critical, then we determine our capacity. And our capacity is just 0.9 times F critical times AG. Pretty simple, okay? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. We're going to do this example here in a bit. Um, uh, we're actually going to start doing that here in a second. This is going to be the example that we do. Um, what I'll show you with table, or what I'll just mention real quick, with table 4-1A is that table 4-1A will require your ability to do this. Remember that? Linear interpolation. Just keep that in mind because that's going to pop up uh, real quick um, here in a little bit. So if it's been a while since you've done linear interpolation, guess what? You're about to get a refresher. Okay. Column analysis using method 1. We're going to take this little pretty picture that I came up with here with the column that was intermediately braced, and we're actually going to analyze this column. I'm going to assume it's a W14 by 90 of A992 steel. For each of these uh, segments, we're going to have different KL over Rs, um, and so we're going to have to uh, assess a, a column that's got funky boundary conditions across different directions. Um, again, as I said, one note moving forward, all of our problems involving columns and beams, unless otherwise stated, will probably incorporate W shapes with 50 KSI steel. Okay, let's break out the notebook and let's get to doing some math. All right, I didn't plug up my fan. Okay, give me one second. All right, so while you all are copying this down, um, I want some help with looking up some properties, okay? This is a W14 by 90. So let's see what we can do here. All right. So first off, uh -huh. All right, for the W14 by 90, I need a few properties. Particularly right now, what I'm going to need is AG 
Rx and Ry. Somebody help me with that. Because you get that out of your AISC 15th edition steel construction manual that everybody brought with them. So AG. Twenty six point five square inches. All right, RX. Woo. What happened there? What happened? I didn't do anything. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, it's working right here. It's still recording and everything. It just suddenly decided to stop displaying. Wait. Yeah, math is just too complicated. <laughs> okay. Everybody see that? Okay, we're going to not touch it and assume everything works just fine. Okay, I don't know what happened there. That was a little weird. Okay, AG is 26.5. What about RX again? 6.14. And what about this one? Okay, I want to... Let me see your manual real quick. I, I want to see something. Okay, perfect. Everybody that brought your AISC 15th edition steel construction manual, I want you to look at something. I just want to plant a seed in your, in your head right now. Look at the very last shape on the page. What is that shape? 14 by 43. Anybody know something about that shape? There's a C. There's a little footnote. What does the C say? Okay, shape is slender for compression with FY equals 50 KSI. We're going to talk about that a little later, okay? But what we're, so let me sort of give you sort of the, the, the general idea of what that means. So there is a phenomenon in the world of steel design uh, or in the world of stability that uh, assesses the difference between global buckling and local buckling. Global buckling is this. Local buckling is what happens when instead of the whole thing buckling, maybe just the flange buckles or just the web buckles. In order for that to happen, the flanges and the webs have to be sufficiently slender themselves. Most W shapes, that's not a problem. If you look at all of the W14s, the vast majority of them do not have the little C note. But some of the smaller shapes do. We are going to talk about that near the end because where that really starts to affect things as a structural engineer is when you're detailing things such as a plate girder for a bridge because you're the one selecting the flange and the web and so on and so forth. And so it's very possible that you have a flange or a web that's governed by local buckling, not global buckling. Uh, but we'll get to that in the end. We're not going to be selecting any shapes where local buckling is an issue anyways. I've configured all the problems where that isn't going to be a, a, an issue, but just want to throw that out there. Okay. We have A992 steel. The only thing that we need is FY. What is FY? 50 KSI. Most problems moving forward are going to have 50 KSI. Okay. Now, let's look at our column schematic right here. Okay. So we have the X axis, we have the Y axis. Okay. Let's deal with the Y axis first. I've got one, two, three segments. Okay. So let's number these. One, two, three. Now, 
Segment one has a pinned boundary condition on the top, a pinned boundary condition on the bottom. So I propose that KY or KY1 is one. What about KY2? KY2 is also one. What about KY3? Oh, hold on, that's a little different. We have a pinned boundary condition up top, but this is fixed. Huh. What is the K value for a column that has a pinned boundary condition on one end and a fixed boundary condition on the other? Y'all remember how to find that? In the back of the manual? It's like 16.1-570. Point eight. Does that make sense? Everybody see that? All right. So for the x-axis, we only have a single segment, and what's kx going to be? 0.8. All right, I want to make sure that we're comfortable with this because I, I want this to be, be clear. Is everybody okay with this? Everybody good? All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to compute our governing KL over R. So, hold on, let me, so specifically we're going to look at the worst case KL over R and the way that I'm going to do this is, is I kind of like to set this up in a table because I think it's kind of easier. Um, oh, hold on. So we have um, four cases. We have the x-axis, but then we have y1, y2, y3. Oh, let me scooch that up a little bit. Okay. Now we have our k values which are 0 0.8, 1, 1, 0 0.8. Is that right? Now our L values. Now the way that I'm going to handle L's is I'm going to go ahead and do my conversions right now. So for example, the x-axis, we have a column that's 35 feet, but that's 420 inches. So let's go ahead and convert that to inches right now. And then for the y-axis, I mean, we look right here, uh, it's 10, 15, and 10. So 10, 15, and 10. So that's 120 inches, 180 inches, 120 inches. And then R, well, Rx, 6.14, and then 3.7, 3.7, 3.7. So, all we now need to compute is KL over R. And I'll, I'll make a few comments about uh, the y-axis here in a bit, but we're going to do all four here in a second, because I'm sure there's probably a couple of you already like, do we really need to do all four? Is there, can we make some observations? Yeah, we can, but I, I want to do it the formal way first. So, Let's do the first row, and I like some precision on this. Let's do like three decimal places. Say it again. 
What are the units? There are none. It's unitless. Okay. So that's that one. Somebody give me the second one, and then I'll, I think you'll probably, somebody else give me the second one, and I think you'll probably get the pattern, and I'll just, I'll do the rest. 32.432. Do I have a second? All right. 32.432. All right. If you do the remaining two, you're going to get 48.650, and you're going to get 25. 0.945. Okay. Now, of these, which one are we going to use for design? KX, right? We're going to use this one. This one is the one that governs. So for our math, KL over R is 54.723. The rest of this becomes kind of boring after this, because if you understood the homework, this is going to be kind of a breeze. But um, one thing I will say is that uh, there's a sort of note on the side. Did we really need to do all three Y elements? Could we have observed which one was going to govern? I mean, let's look at the, the Y axis. All right, here's the Y axis right here. Let's look at our K values. The two upper segments have a bigger K value than the bottom one, right? And if we look at the lengths, the middle one is longer than the top and bottom. So isn't this middle one going to have the largest KL over R just by looking at it? I have no problem if you do that on a homework or exam, if you look at it and just go, that's the one, right? I'm okay with that. As long as, number one, you check both axes. you got to check the x-axis and the y-axis. And two, if you're unsure, do it this way. Do it, check them all. Okay? So far, so good? All right. After this, the, the rest of the homework becomes kind of kind of boring. Okay? So, so what we're going to do for step two is compute... FE, so FE pi squared E divided by KL over R squared. Anybody remember E? Hopefully. 29,000 KSI, that's the number I want. Burned into your brain when you get out of here. It's like 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. It's just a, you need to know it. Or 98. 10 if you're a metric person. All right. Now, for KL over R, all I'm going to do is say fifty four point seven two three squared. So, plug and chug, and what do I get for this? Ninety-five point five eight. Do I have a second on that? And what are my units? Boom. Now, step three is to compute F critical. Now, there's a little more to it than just a plug and chug expression. We have to figure out which equation that we need to use. And the way that we do that is we compare our KL over R of 54.723 to our anchor point, if you will, of 4.71 square root of E over FY. And so when we plug and chug for this, what do we get? One thirteen point four, something like that. Do I have a second? Yeah. What does this tell me? 
Here's KL over R. Here's our, our limit. What does that tell me? Why did I do that? To choose which expression that we need to use, right? So which one do I use? Do I use the 0.877 or the 658? The 65, yeah, there you go. So because this is an, a column where KL over R is less than 4.71 square root of E over FY. Therefore, here, let me do less than a little better. So inelastic. Buckling governs. And so we use FCR as 0 0.658. And remember, it's raised. To that fraction. It's not 0.658 times this fraction raised to this fraction because we want that exponential effect. And I'll show you a couple little tricks as you're doing homework and exam problems to see whether or not you're on the right track. What do we get for this? All right, do I have a second on that? All right. Everybody pay attention to this. This is kind of important. During our lecture last time, one of the first things that I did is I derived that differential equation solution for you, Euler buckling, right? The elastic buckling expression. That's this, right? And what did we get? We got a number that's way the heck higher than 50 KSI, right? So it's elastic buckling stress is well over 50. That is probably a good indicator that when you do this check, inelastic buckling is going to govern and you're going to use this equation. Whereas on the flip side, if I had a really high slenderness and I got my FE value was like 20 KSI, that's a pretty slender column and probably elastic buckling is going to govern. Now, if we're in the, that middle range, it could be either one. I'm, I'm saying that you should use that as a check in your head to go, am I doing this right or not? Does that make sense? Okay. It's possible when you get into that, that area there because the curve gets pretty nonlinear. So. And so finally, to compute our capacity, VPN, we just take 0 0.9 F critical times AG. And what was that, 26.5? And so, let's say VPN, we'll just say like one decimal place. 958.2, do I have a second on that? And you might have a point 0.1 or a point naught, you know, depending upon your rounding. Boom. And so if you, does this column have a weaker capacity than it is under tension for gross section yielding? Well, yeah, because for gross section yielding, 0.9 FYAG, it's obviously, you know, it's weaker under compression than it is under gross section yielding and tension. So, yeah, like I said, column behavior and compression, or behavior and compression is different than behavior and tension, that's for sure. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? All right, let me see. So we're going to be using 50 KSI for FY most of the time. Can you just remember that 113.4? Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. It wasn't 113.4 on your last homework, though. No, it was like 
Cause, because it was the 36 KSI. All right, let me introduce the next, the next method, and then we're going to call it. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Okay. I want everybody to turn to table 4-1, to this table. This is the first design aid where it takes a little bit of thought on how to do this. And so I want everybody's attention. We're not going to do it today, but I really want everybody to pay attention. This, some of these computations can get a little long, right? Because you got to do the FE, the F critical, the 4.71. Like it takes a while. Obviously, you can spreadsheet this, but if you're, you know, doing routine design, this takes a little while. It takes a little while. Um, table 4.1 will make our life easier, although table 4.1a only works for 50 KSI. Make sure that you're paying attention to which table that you're using because table 4.1b, I believe it's for 65. I think there's a table 4.1c for 70, although mostly what we're doing is, uh, is using the 50 KSI. Okay. I want to have somebody look at this. Uh, go to table 4-1a, and I want you to read out this part right here, this part on, on, the, on the right, or on the left, sorry. What does that, that say, that row say? Effective length L with respect to what? The least radius of direction. Least, but what, what? RY. RY. So let me explain what this column or what this table is doing. What this table is doing is it's taking your KL to be 6 feet, 7 feet, 8 feet, 9 feet, 10 feet, 11 feet. So KL is 10, 11 feet. And it is assuming that you're using RY. So for this KL of 11 feet, it computes a KL over R, plug and chugs, and gives you a capacity. So for a 12 by 96, the capacity is 1,110 kips. It does everything we just did and just puts that number right there. But the problem is, is that the table is written, it's listing the column capacity based on the weak axis. Okay? It always assumes that the weak axis buggling governs. But we know from what we just did that that might not be the case, right? The column we just did, it was governed by the x-axis. So how does that work, okay? Well, if you have a column where the weak axis governs, just look up your capacity based on your KL. But if it's the other case, like the column we just did, we need to do a conversion. And what we do is we basically set our KL over, our, KL over R's equal to one another, and instead of going into the table with KL in the X direction, we go with this adjusted KL or this effective KL. And what we do is we take KL in the X direction divided by this ratio of RX to RY. Look at the bottom of the table. What do you see? RX to RY ratios for each column. You see that? What's going to happen is that when you do that, for real life columns, you are not going to get a pretty KL. You're going to get a KL of 15.69342 feet. And the table is not going to list a value for 16 for 15.392 feet or whatever. It's going to list 15 feet and 16 feet and 17 feet. And it is going to require you to linearly interpolate. So here's your analysis method for method two. You determine the largest. KL uh, in the X direction and KL in the Y direction. If KLX is smaller than KLY, just look up the capacity. If KLX is bigger than KLY, you look up the capacity based on whichever of these two is larger, KLY and KL effective. More often than not, you will need to linearly interpolate, so make sure you remember how to do that. So if I have two values in a table and I need to interpolate between them, there's your linear interpolation expression. And so we are going to do this column again on Friday and see if we get 958. In the meantime, you have a homework assignment where the homework assignment you're going to be analyzing using method one to make sure that you're comfortable with it. Two final points before I close the lecture. Number one, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, number one. Um, the boundary conditions that are on the homework assignment. 
mimic symbol for symbol the K conditions in the table in the back. So pay attention to the symbols because some will look like this, some will have the box. And if you look at the table, those are different boundary conditions. So make sure that you're paying attention to that. Two, again, do me this favor again. We got our, our um, uh, guest coming in on Friday. If you can't show up on time uh, and, and be on your best behavior, I will see you all on Friday. That's all I got. I'm going to stop the recording on that question. <laughs>